you saw students relying so much on their friends and their teachers for the mental health support that they actually needed from professionals. Welcome to Talking About Kids. I am your host, R. Bradley Snyder, researcher, activist, and author of The Five Simple Truths of Raising Kids. Speak Up, Stand Up, Save a Life is an annual conference in Phoenix, Arizona that aims to empower middle school students to organize and to be change makers at their home campuses. This year, the conference focused on identifying and overcoming the barriers that prevent kids from accessing mental health or suicide prevention services for themselves or for their friends. As one of the conference organizers, I chose to interview Nagasaraya Ramazetti and Kaylee Woods. When Nagasaraya and Kaylee were high school students. Each started movements at the respective schools that continue to improve the mental health of students and community members. Our conversation was recorded in front of the live audience at the conference. This podcast was sponsored in part by the Arizona Department of Health Services must stop bullying campaign through its Title V maternal and child health program. For more information, go to muststopbullying.org. And now, the interview. Kaylee, just describe a little bit about what you did at your school. Okay, hi everyone. Glad the mic's working. (laughs) Um, So during the pandemic, it was um, the end of my freshman year and kind of going into my sophomore year, we had online school. And during that time, I felt really separated from everybody else. Like it was just me alone um, at my home watching blank screens learn about English. Uh, And during that time, I realized that I wanted to connect more with other students but I didn't really know how. And so thankfully my school gave me the opportunity to uh, become an ambassador for the Yellow Ribbon Organization, which is a suicide prevention organization. And through that, I created my school's first mental health club. Um, Thank you, thank you. (laughs) Um, And through that, I started it my sophomore year during the pandemic, during online school. Like who goes to clubs? through Zoom, but um, I attempted to do that, and I, it's continuing on. I've graduated, but in my senior year, I was a part of the Governor's Youth Commission, and the Mental Health Commission I worked with, we were able to create a toolkit um, about guidelines, about how to start mental health clubs in your own school, and we administered those toolkits out to administrations all over Arizona. Um, so that's kind of my involvement in the mental health world. Thank you, Shariah. Hello, everybody. Um, So my involvement in mental health actually started after the pandemic. Um, I attended a very academically rigorous high school, and so we knew that going into the pandemic that it was very difficult to maintain that valuable student-teacher connection and actually make sure that students were learning effectively online. Coming back from the pandemic, it was increasingly obvious that like the student body population at my high school were definitely suffering and didn't have the resources to effectively address it. So what I did was create a comprehensive research survey of my entire high school and use that to lobby school administration so that we could get professional mental health support on campus. And I'm happy to say that Back then, that definitely took steps in the right direction, and we were able to get a school counselor on scene. And even now, we have a permanent school counselor, and I got the update uh, just earlier this school year that now we have a counselor at 
on campus at my high school on Thursdays from 9 to 2 every single day and my old teacher texted me that and it was one of the most incredible texts that I was able to receive that day, I think. So there you go. So there's two things that you can do immediately. One, connect with another organization that's working in different schools. Tag onto them, use their resources. But then the other thing that we heard was you can demonstrate the need. You've heard other people say that it's getting increasingly hard to study young people, to ask them important questions. But you're a young person. You can speak up for your peers. You can ask them those questions and demonstrate that need. But when we hear you talk, it, it sounds rather matter of fact. Uh, I know a little bit more about your stories than listeners might. Uh, so you encountered a lot of different obstacles. I want to talk about one that hasn't been as addressed today uh, it, as I'd like to, uh, it to have been, and that is overcoming cultural norms about mental health problems. I know both of you faced that as an obstacle. Kaylee? Definitely, that is um, something I would love to talk about. I come from Yuma, Arizona. I'm not sure if any of you guys know about Yuma, Arizona. Um, thank you, I, I love Yuma. But um, we're right by Mexico and California. Uh, so we have a huge Hispanic population. I'm Hispanic myself. And a lot of times within the Hispanic culture, mental health isn't something we really discuss. It's not something we're expected to talk about. So that's definitely a hurdle I faced when trying to start my club was the fact that a lot of kids didn't feel like mental health was something we should be talking about because it's really embedded in our culture to kind of... Um, keep it in your own mind, keep it to yourself. And so going through that, um, I'm grateful that I'm from the Hispanic community, so I was able to have my own perspective into that culture. And then also the officers, which is like vice president, treasurer, and secretary, they were all of different um, cultures and communities. So we were able to bring our own insights in order to try to reach as many people as possible and try to break those barriers. Do you remember anything that you, you said or any verbiage that you used that you saw really resonated and changed people's ideas? In terms of verbiage I used, I really tried to talk about the importance of just having a conversation with people. Like a lot of times, the idea of mental health seems like such a scary and huge topic, but what can help is just a simple conversation, simply asking about your day, you know, how are your teachers, uh, how's homework going, kind of having that down-to-earth conversation with people can have a much bigger impact than you would think. So while it seems scary to straight up ask, how is your mental health right now, taking small steps into asking about their life and making connections with people can make a bigger difference than you realize. It's such a really interesting point because uh, you know, recently we had on the podcast the head of juvenile psychiatry mm -hmm. for Phoenix Children's Hospital, and that was her advice too. It ask if you think that somebody is struggling with somebody something, ask them about it. It was that first step that she recommended for all teachers, all students, all peers. So really interesting. So Nagishraya, what was your experience with these cultural norms? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in terms of cultural norms, I was in a similar boat as Kaylee because the student population at my high school was primarily Asian American. And mental health is kind of a iffy subject when it comes to that uh, cultural background. And it was something that I faced barriers with even personally. Um, so recognizing that need both in my school community, my peers, my friends, and myself led me to have very unique insight into how difficult a conversation this was to have. Because at the end of the day, the biggest barrier to mental health access and the um, access to these mental health resources is silence and stigma and the lack of normalization of mental health services. So really just starting that conversation, breaking down that barrier and stepping forward to my school administration and say, here's the need, here's the statistics, um, really allowed me to address those cultural mm. issues and really start 
making the necessary steps to increase access to a population that otherwise did not have access to these resources outside of school. From both of your stories, what I'm inferring, and tell me if I'm getting this wrong, is that the conversations among you and your peers were a little bit easier than the conversations between you and the adults, uh, either at the school or even at the home. Is that right? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Sorry. No, no. Yes, I think we both mm -hmm. have that experience. Mm -hmm. I know for at least me, we did have a social worker after the pandemic, a full-time social worker at the school. Um, but a lot of times she would actually refer students to my club instead because um, a lot of kids uh, find it really hard to open up to adults and people who aren't their age because it's intimidating. Like, um, it's kind of scary having that power balance. But being able to talk to your peers, it makes it a lot easier to discuss more difficult topics because you don't feel intimidated or um, pressured by a higher power adult. Oh, absolutely. Even beyond that, we didn't have a social worker or really any access to mental health resources at my school. Um, the only thing that we had was our peers, was our teachers, and you would see, this was part of the survey that I, um, the survey questions that I had asked about, but you saw students relying so much on their friends and their teachers for the mental health support that they actually needed from professionals or a individual that could provide them with actual help, but instead they were kind of falling back into comfortable conversations with people that they knew that they could trust, which, let me be clear, is absolutely critical, and mm. friends are a central part of your mental health support network, but in terms of getting actual help, yeah. it was critical that we moved beyond that and provided access to professional resources as well. I, I think that's a really good point, because I don't want any young person to believe that this is an issue they need to solve on their own, right? And it, and it sounds like, again, the young people, they know what's going on. It's that translating it and getting those adults to support it. Do you have any tips for which adults to reach out to? How to identify that adult that's going to be an ally, but still going to listen to what you bring? Um, from my experience, because I was working primarily with school administration and teachers, um, I am incredibly thankful for the teachers at my school. They were very explicit about the fact that we could reach out to them in that way if we needed anything, and for that I am forever grateful. But in terms of finding someone similar who you would be able to comfortably have that conversation with, it comes with not only recognizing who you can get close with, because I think that when there's a fundamental distance between students and their teachers or administrators, it's hard to have that conversation ever. Right. But once you're able to become closer with your teachers, and for me personally, I became friends with my teachers, um, that really allows you to start that conversation that would otherwise be difficult with that power balance that Kaylee was mentioning. And to be clear, this doesn't necessarily have to be teachers, this could be your parents, this could be church, um, church officials, this could be like anyone that you trust, any community member or leader that means something to you and you're able to have that connection and conversation with. Yes, and I definitely agree to add on to that. Um, I found a lot of students felt more comfortable with kind of their club advisors or teachers of the fine arts right. because they spent a lot of time with those sort of teachers and they were able to build those connections. Excellent. So what other, and again, you do make it sound you know, rather easy. I know it wasn't. What, how long did it take to really start to show progress in each of your initiatives? Um, for me personally, this was an idea that had been bounced around from so many sources, so many students, um, probably for a few months at that point, because we had just come back from the pandemic. And this was an idea that everyone was like, we really need some kind of support system on campus. We really need someone here. And I and two of my friends at the time um, were the first students to be like, okay, let's do something about that. And in terms of actually getting everything set up, it started with an email. It mm. just started with a quick email saying, hey, we are three students that firmly believe that there is a need for mental health services at our school, and we 
simply want to take a survey. And that's a terrifying email to send, let me tell you, because you're talking to a school administrator, but at the end of the day, simply reaching out and establishing that pathway of communication, I think, was central. So in terms of actually getting started and actually making progress, that's a 10-minute thing. Wow. Yeah, and I had a similar experience in the way that I kind of started off with just a text to my friend who I knew was very social with other people and said, hey, I was thinking about starting this mental health club. Do you want to join me? And she was like, yeah, that sounds really cool. And of course, it started off like that, but trying to get a club going and starting is a little more difficult than just um, one text message. Especially during the pandemic, it was hard to get kids to want to go on to Zoom longer than they had to be. Um, but one thing that really kept me going was even if I just had like five people in my Zoom meeting in the beginnings, I was still having an impact on those five people. I was still creating connections with those five people. And it eventually, once we, once we started getting into in-person school, I was able to garner more people, more partnerships, and um, make a bigger difference. But I always say that you can make a big difference in a small group. It doesn't have to be at a large scale right. because if you're just touching one life, then it continues on from there. But, but I also know, and again, I know you two uh, better than they do right now, <laughs> than the listeners do right now. Um, and you've had tremendous success, but I also know there are setbacks. I also know that there are moments, because I, I don't want anybody listening to think that you know, I just, I'm going to follow these steps. I, I have to imagine there were times when you felt a little alone, like, why am I doing this? Nobody seems to care. Does it have to be me that does it? Okay, see, I'm, I'm seeing smiles and laughter there. So how do you get over that? How do you get over that feeling of, you know, I, I'll just take this time back. I don't want this, this is extra time on my schedule. I'm just trying to get through my own day. How do you get over those feelings? I can go ahead with this. So this is totally embarrassing, but I had an in-person meeting and no one showed up. It was just me waiting in the room for like 30 minutes with my coloring pages that I bought for everyone to color in. Um, and that was really kind of a setback, like, oh, no, no one's here, no one showed up. Kind of, am I actually making a difference? Am I actually making an impact? But one thing that really kept me going was that I tried another meeting and more people came. So of course there's going to be setbacks, of course there's going to be times where things don't work out and no one shows up to your club meeting. But if you create that space where people feel comfortable to show up sometimes and then show up another time, hmm. um, it's worth it in my mind. So that's what kept me going is that I don't know how the future is going to go and why stop now when if I keep going I can make an incredible impact in the future. Nagashraya, how about you? Yeah, for me personally, my setbacks definitely came with talking to school administration and saying, hey, can we do it this way? And then being like, nah, um, which was really unfortunate. There were times where the first time that we had a school counselor available, I was like, that, this is really awesome. We need to introduce them properly to the students because no one's going to feel comfortable talking to someone if you don't advertise them if you don't allow them to like meet this individual and really connect with them and the school administration fully was like eh, it's not that big of a deal it's fine but that inherently set up this barrier where students were just fully unaware that there was a counselor which is kind of terrible because we finally got like the professional services through the doors and then they were right there and students had no way of accessing them because they simply didn't know. And moments like that really left me frustrated with the higher powers that be, meaning my school admin. Right. Um, but it also reminded me that this was just a matter of advocacy and communication once again. And that's why when I received that text message that there was finally a school counselor on campus, that students had continued the work that I started with the initial uh, mental health initiative, when I got that text message, it entirely made my week, if not my month, because that was a sign that it might seem like a small little step that you're taking right, right now, but you have no idea the impacts that will resonate from that. So Kaylee um, Nagashraya just mentioned one of the ways that she knows that she's being successful. 
How do you know that your work was successful? So this was a really proud moment for me and a bit complicated, but my um, school gave me the opportunity to teach a class about my club. Um, so they had a day where different um, professionals from the town came in and gave classes and the students could decide if they wanted to stay home or go to the classes. Um, and my administration said, hey, would you be wanting to teach a class to these students? And I, uh, we were the only club given that opportunity. And I was like nervous, because who am I to teach a class to kids my age? Like, what if no one shows up again? Um, but thankfully, the day of, we had about 300 kids show up to my class, which was so exciting. And um, during that class, we had a little paper at the front where you could sign up to learn more about the club. Um, and eventually, I had to put three papers there, and then four papers there, and five papers there, because kids were genuinely interested in talk talking about this topic. And also at the table near us, we had little yellow ribbons. And the next day at school, I saw yellow ribbons on so many kids' backpacks. Um, and so that was a proud moment for me of realizing that I uh, was actually making a difference in kids' lives. Nagashreya and Kaylee, I want to thank you both so much for taking time to come and talk to us today. You're not going to mention this um, because it has nothing to do with why you got started, but I want to let everybody listening know that they've also been recognized for their contributions, and it's a big reason why both of you are Flynn Scholars, full rides to college, study abroad money, all that great stuff. So give them a great big round of applause. They're amazing. Thank you both so much. That was Nagasaraya Ramazetti and Kaylee Woods. For more information about Nagasaraya, Kaylee, or Speak Up, Stand Up, Save a Life, please visit talkingaboutkids.com. From there, you also can find out about upcoming episodes, suggest a topic, learn more about me and my books, or submit your questions for future guests. Our theme song is by The Senators. For more of their music, go to thesenatorsmusic.com. And remember, kids are young goats and young humans. And the difference is that young goats are easier to manage. <laughs>